this episode of the Tennis IQ podcast. I'm Brian Lomax. And I'm Josh Berger. And for today's episode, we have a special guest, Nikola Milinkovic. And Nikola is somebody that I've known for, I think, around four or five years now. Um, we're both alumni of the same university, Clark University in Western Massachusetts. And uh, we have been connected uh, through that, through both you know, be both being Clarkies and also uh, living in Fairfield County, Connecticut, where I lived up until just a few months ago. Um, and actually, um, another connection is um, through Nicola's work at Intensity, um, I had uh, actually done one of my first sports psychology presentations at Intensity on the topic of controlling the controllables, which is actually something um, we will dive a little bit into during this conversation. Um, but in terms of Nikola's bio, uh, Nikola Milinkovic has extensive work experience in sport and performance psychology and leadership coaching across a variety of high-performing environments. Nikola works with team and individual athletes, currently focusing on elite junior, ATP, and WTA tennis players. Nikola spent over a decade directing sports psychology pro- programs in high-performance tennis settings in the U.S. and the Netherlands. He played college tennis as a certified mental performance consultant, CMPC, through the Association for Applied Sports Psychology, and a certified professional level coach through the U.S. Professional Tennis Registry, the U.S. PTR. Um, in addition to having worked in sport, Nikola transferred his expertise into sport organizations in Serbia, the United Nations, and the performing arts industry. He served as a visiting performance and leadership consultant consultant at Belgrade Sports Coaching Academy, UNICEF, and as a learning and development and performance management coordinator for the UN agencies in the Netherlands. Nicola appeared on national television and is an international published author and presenter. He earned his BA degree in psychology and theater arts from Clark University and his Ed M degree in counseling with focus on sports psychology from Boston University. I hope you all really enjoy this conversation. All right, we are we are excited to have our guest today, Nikola Milinkovic. Nikola, thanks for joining us. Thanks for the invite. Good to be here. Well, I know we're uh, excited to talk to you. We've got uh, you know some topics that we want to get into, but uh, yeah, we figured we'd start by uh, you telling us how you how you got into the sport of tennis. Uh, you know, it really happened, uh, I think I was maybe, maybe six or so, something like that. And I know I saw it on TV. I mean, and, uh, um, I kind of always saw myself more as a student rather than, than as an athlete, I guess, very early on. And so there's something mathematical about it that made sense, um, about playing within a confined space. You have a net in the middle, you have to problem solve sort of like it's a rectangle. So, you know, there's something mathematical about it and it, I thought it made sense you know I grew up playing uh, basketball and uh, soccer or football if you will um, and so uh, you know I did have the athleticism and I love sports but uh, something about it just kind of made sense and literally that's how I picked up I found a club nearby um, started taking started taking lessons so that was that was really it was just a visual attraction <laughs> There we go. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about about that journey? How um, how you started getting more serious into tennis? Um, you know, started playing tournaments and, um, and and a little bit more about you know where you grew up and, and what that was like. Yeah, sure. So I, I'm I'm uh, I was born and raised in in Serbia. Um, I lived in I lived there until I was 16, and then started moving around internationally. Um, but uh, I started competing kind of early on, to be honest. I, I guess, uh, you know, if I were to go by my coaches, I mean, the, the technical aspect of the game is something that I kind of picked up pretty quickly. It was, I was able to do that. And they did it, obviously played a really big part in that someone has to teach you. Um, but uh, the fact that I went into competition maybe a little bit too soon or just progressively uh, as I was getting better and playing with, kids that were maybe a year or two older, um, I was kind of pulled into it and I wasn't really ready at all. Um, I didn't uh, have any competitive tools essentially other than the skill of the game, which I was improving in fairly quickly. And so 
um, that's where the challenge came, uh, you know, when I was a junior around between 11 and 13 is really the struggle uh, of, of competing. And, and um, you know, I went through some pretty severe anxiety um, that was getting kind of worse and worse. Um, and I didn't really know what to do, you know. So the biggest challenge for me was actually that mental and the emotional side um, of, of tennis. Uh, the physical side, I mean, I, you know, I enjoyed fitness. I enjoyed getting stronger and faster. And the technical side was, was I guess, always there with, with continuous tweaks and, and things like that. But really the, the mental and the emotional piece was, was sort of lacking. And, um, uh, you know, it was, just, it was just tough out there uh, to, to compete that early without a, a foundation of what to do, how, how to even approach thinking about this, this game in a, you know, in a, in a mental and emotional way. So, um, and so I actually put my rackets down for about two to three years in high school, um, end of middle school, first half of high school. And then I went back to tennis junior and senior year, which is really when sort of my, uh, my game picked up and, and uh, going into college uh, really escalated and, and everything turned 360. Uh, so all these, all these experiences that were troublesome now became uh, more a, a growth moment and a weapon in some way that, um, you know, I was able to kind of befriend that anxiety uh, through the years. And, you know, I think a part of that was changing countries, changing cultures, having lived in around people that perceive tennis differently, that literally use different words to describe certain things and teach you the game. And that was probably the best thing for me because it clicked from different angles and I could feed off of other people's perspectives and steal quote unquote what I liked and disregard what I didn't like. So that actually was a life-changing experience in that sense um, uh, just overall, you know, which later kind of got me into sports psychology and uh, to go um, stud you know, study psychology in university and then sports psychology in graduate school and then pick up the career of it, uh, you know, for the past 13, 14 years. And what, and what inspired you to, um, a, after that break, to, to get back to it? I, I, it, it, makes, it makes a lot of sense that, you know, being in a new environment with, you know, new language or new words would, um, would, would, would change actually how you perceive the sport. But what, what inspired you to, to get back into it in the first place? Yeah, that's a great question. I, uh, you know, it was a combination of things. I, I sort of realized not, nothing, I guess, nothing that I've experienced comes in a vacuum isolated. Everything comes in a combo of two or three, you know? So uh, for me, it was really the, you know, I went to, into an American high school in Europe, actually. I graduated from an American high school in the Netherlands. And uh, as you guys know, uh, here or in the American system, you, you play on a team, even tennis. Um, that was actually probably the biggest thing for me that allowed me to you know, manage the anxiety in a positive way to befriend it, um, as I like to say, it was really the the fact that I played on a team that, you know, my anxiety, for example, was not only mine, but it was everybody else's, not not from a selfish standpoint, but, you know, I could, people could, could help me. Um, and we had uh, 12, 13 players, everyone was from a different country, the coach was from a different country, so it was like the world, and uh and having been, um, as I said previously, just around people who perceive tennis differently, who speak about tennis differently, use different words to describe certain situations in the game, and being able to play on a team. So instead of I'm not just an individual playing by myself and I'm left to my own tools, and I, you know, it's like fight or flight, swimmer or or sink. Um, that was, that was absolutely massive for me is the fact that I was able to do that. And, um, I, I missed it to begin with, you know, I it took a break for about two to three years. And I didn't pick up a racket. I played other sports, uh, especially basketball, but that was always a game for fun for me. I still love to play it. Um, and, but I never really saw myself as a competitive athlete in any other sport other than tennis. So when I saw that there are tryouts, uh, I literally, this, this love for, for, for tennis that I had came back and I missed it so much. Um, and having taken that break, I think allowed me to, uh, 
just reflect, allowed me to mature a little bit, allowed me to, as I said, take a break from everything, just pause things um, and then uh, and then go back to it. So, so, you know, I would say it's a combination of a few things there. Yeah. So I, your, your story definitely resonates with me, Nicola. I went through not quite as bad or dramatic as an experience as that, but I remember in, when I was 16, I was going through a phase of choking in tournaments. And the first instances of it were only in finals of tournaments. I mean, it was good. I was getting to finals, but then I was choking badly, like right from the beginning, wouldn't even be competitive. It was so bad. And then that started to bleed into the first rounds of tournaments. Oh, and it right. really forced me to, to take a break as well. Um, and is the same thing that saved me was my high school team and just deciding to play, you know, high school tennis and playing for something bigger than myself kind of righted the ship a little bit. I got, you know, sort of, I figured things out. I was able to get through some of that, that anxiety, you know, and you mentioned befriending the anxiety, you know, that's a, um, I think it's a really great way to look at it. And I would imagine that that's somewhat influence the work that you're doing with players today and and helping them them through that so i'd like to you know hear a little bit more about you know how you're working with players to 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 help them perhaps get to the place where you did where you're befriending anxiety handling it um you know, what, what are some things that you're doing with players today yeah i uh i you know a lot of uh, a lot of you and professionals to be honest as well you know uh, people go through people go through that different things I think cause us to to feel anxious um, uh, and so you know some of the maybe some of the most common ones that I have seen or experienced are the difference between practice and competition um, that's something that I comes up uh, as maybe the number one thing um, and this idea that what when it's competition, oh, I have to perform. This is the time to show everything I've got. And it's almost like there's no room for error. Um, this is this is it. It's almost like this is the only moment, even though maybe you play every weekend. But every time it's, you know, this is it. I have to show, you know, I have to. So that is that can sometimes be a little bit tricky um, in, in our perception of it. Uh, but also I feel like just different things cause us to feel that pressure. It could be uh, you know, our own expectations, what we expect of ourselves. Um, it could be expectations uh, that uh, of others. And maybe with juniors, if I, if I work, you know, parents and coaches play a big part in that. Um, and and n not even deliberately in any way, but, you know, players feel like they want to satisfy expe expectations of people who invested so much into them, uh, time, energy, financially. So, parents and coaches primarily. Um, and, uh, and I feel like that can really cause a lot of the stress going into competition. Um, so, but yeah, so th there's a variety of, um, you know, from what I have seen a variety of reasons, but those might be some of the common ones, let's say. Um, and so, you know, usually what, what typically what, what I do, I kind of like to take a, a, a really comprehensive approach to it simply because I've I've, I've gotten to know the anxiety search pretty well over the past 20 years. Really, it's been, uh, you know, we've, we've, we've had a, we've had a, uh, a great relationship. <laughs> um, so, you know, for, for example, you know, I kind of, my approach in, in, I guess, helping, helping people deal with it is um, uh, it's, it's threefold. So there's an emotional piece, mental piece, and then the behavioral piece in a way. Um, and, you know, from, from the emotional piece, really, it's kind of, uh, you know, how, uh, how well can you embrace what you're experiencing? Because the emotional piece is really something we don't talk about uh, too much, or I feel like people are not really sure how to, how to even kind of wrap their mind around it. Um, uh, but, you know, being an active participant and an observer in, in your own life, um, and so, uh, you know, for example, creating, I'm a big fan of journaling. I think uh, writing things down is a great way to get things out, that there's evidence of things that exist, you know, of your experiences of what you're feeling, let's say. So, I'll, you know, I'll never, I'll never forget my high school French teacher used to say, fastest way to the brain is through the pen. <laughs> um, and, 
I did, it didn't make sense then, but it makes sense now when I'm doing this. And in a way that's, but not typing because, you know, computer, you also have distractions, a notification here, message here, something pops up. All of a sudden your, your mind goes to from one uh, stimuli to the other, but really paper and pen, just, you know, feeling your hand writing, feeling your hand on the paper. It's, you know, talking about mindfulness. It's really a good way to be present. Um, and, uh, you know, so, uh, I think journalism is fantastic. You know, it doesn't even have to be in a structured way, but just getting stuff out so that there's evidence of it. It's a little bit easier to accept when you, you know, when you can do that. Um, and, you know, if you say anxiety, let's say uh, you, you're feeling anxious or we're feeling anxious. And so that's a, that's, I think that's kind of like basic awareness um, that I find actually a lot of people have that, you know, I think awareness is really where, uh, the inner growth begins. And I found players do have a lot of awareness. When you ask them the right questions, they can give you the answer. Um, and feeling anxious is a great um, umbrella term, uh, but let's dive a little bit deeper, right? So, um, uh, you know, I like, to, I like to talk about, okay, so what are some of the underlying maybe feelings under that? You could be feeling afraid, you could be feeling confused. Uh, vulnerable. Uh, you could be feeling worried. You could be feeling stressed, and so these are really uh, the these are the underlying terms that that when, once you start to dive in, that's when you really then then you know hit the right spot, and that's when you can really kind of wrap your mind around it and be honest to yourself uh, in terms of what you're experiencing. And so you know, a part of that is also kind of. Uh, allowing yourself to experience what you do, just giving yourself permission. Um, but, um, uh, you know, I think we all tend to kind of fight uh, that unpleasant feeling, which is normal on one hand, but then if you, pers if you resist, it will persist and it might come back to haunt you stronger and stronger and in a way won't leave you alone. So I think that the first emotional piece is really important. The, how well can you embrace uh, something that you're experiencing? And then, the, the kind of the, the mental side is, uh, you know, engaging your mind. That's really where you can. So, you know, if you talk about, you know, this feels like a threat to me in some way, um, you know, uh, causes me stress or fear. And, you know, just then how big of a threat really is it? You know, what's the worst thing that can happen um, in a match? Um, you know, what is the worst thing? And, and that could be nothing, you know, I'm just going to lose and that's it. Or it could be, well, I might, my ranking might drop. My dad or my coach might give me grief about it. You know, the car ride home, we all talk about that as the worst moment of <laughs> giving feedback to, to, to players. You know, that's, that's kind of, uh, uh, that, that's kind of what comes up. Um, but, you know, frequently when, when we kind of reflect back and say, what is the, what is the worst thing or the scariest thing that can happen? Uh, frequently, it's it's not really anything. Um, it could be just our own interpretation of it, our own imagination of it, because we add so much to that experience that at the core, it just is what it is. But then we add so much of it because we think about the future or about our past results or past outcomes. Um, and um, and so then, you know, the sort of like the last piece of that is what can I do, the behavioral piece of like, what can I do to excel, you know? Uh, and that's really where the mental skills come in. So using specific self-talk, use, you know, breathing, mental imagery, um, executing certain short-term goals or just immediate goals that can help you in that process. But I, I would say it's a combination of, you know, embracing how we feel, engaging our mind, and then really acting upon certain things to excel and, um, manage that situation, manage that anxiety, let's say, in the most successful way. I mean, there's a lot to unpack there, I think, right, Josh? There um, is. <laughs> you know, uh, and, and maybe you can hit on some some different points, Josh. But I think, you know, one of the first things you said, Nicolo, that remi it reminded me of um, Iga Sviantek and her run at the French Open. And one of their mantras was, you know, keep expectations low and standards high. And, and you kind of talked about, you know, there's a lot of expectations around players, whether that be parents, your coaches, or just perhaps this sort of general feeling that everybody expects me to do something the right way. And, yeah. um, and yeah, so, yeah, yeah. you know, expectations, I think, is, is something that, you know, we always have to kind of deal with and temper and are they real? 
and uh, you know what are the ones that actually matter but i i really liked how they turned it around into you know expectations are basically out of your control more or less but mm. standards are in your control and if you can yeah, bring that's a great word that's a great word yeah and i think you can, if you can like focus on bringing excellence to your standards whether that even be with some of the things you just said breathing all right let me bring excellence to how i manage my breathing on the court or how I manage uh, my body language, my responses, mm -hmm. you know? And so I thought that, 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 you know, we, we, we had a, quite the segment on that. What do you think, Josh? What are some things that, you know, you wanted to unpack out of that, that response? Yeah. Yeah. I, I really like how you broke it down into um, the, the three pieces of it, the, the mental uh, or, the, or the emotional, the mental and the behavioral, um, and I, you know, as, as sports psychology coaches and practitioners, I know we, we spent a lot of time, you know, we, we spend a lot of time teaching, you know, teaching these mental, mental tools that, you know, that, that we can utilize, uh, which would, you know, more so maybe fall into that behavioral piece. But I think, I think a big piece that, that you're hitting on is that acceptance, that acknowledging and, you know, being aware of this is something I'm feeling right now. This is happening. You know, there's no use fighting it or denying it. But let's, you know, let's, let's acknowledge it, let's accept it. And then we can move on in, in terms of how we want to address it in terms of what's the best um, so solution to, to moving forward. You know, if it's, if you're playing in a match and, you know, it's a, it's a tie break, third set tie break or something. And, you know, and, and you feel your heart pounding, you can, you can say, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling that right now, but do I have the tools? Have I developed the tools in the, you know, in the mental skills classroom, um, in the sports psychology classroom with a, with a coach, whatever it may be to, to cope with that when I'm, when I'm feeling that way. So I think, I think, uh, to me that, that awareness piece and that acceptance is, is huge in, in terms of still performing well when you're feeling those, um, when you, when you're feeling anxiety, um, I, I guess from, from your experience, Nicola, is there, is there one of one piece of those three pieces that you have found um, athletes struggle with the most? Uh, I would say, yeah, yeah, I think the acceptance really is, is the one that that's maybe the most challenging, you know, uh, you know, I, I just think that we, uh, we, we, we use our mind a lot, which is obviously it's there for us to do that. Uh, but you, you know, it's tough to, it's tough to, um, to be logical about things, it's tough to even to, to perceive things in a you know in a in a way in a structured way when emotion is so is so strong. Um, so you know th that acceptance in a way is, I think that's probably the most challenging uh, aspect of it is is helping people understand why it's so important um, and that it's not necessarily you're not accepting defeat it's not like oh i'm accepting that i'm nervous and there's nothing i can do it's not that it's more i'm accepting so that i so that because so that i don't fight it anymore so that i'm not because it's you know it's like you, you're already experiencing it it's it's uh, you're already late in quote quote unquote so now it's like okay what am i going to do with this information this is my body telling me something and um and it actually allows you to use the tools or maybe the skill set or maybe to perceive it a different way um, and do something with that information. Um, and so that's really the, the power of it. And we talk about mindfulness nowadays so much. And that's one part of being mindful is, is, is the acceptance piece. And so awareness kind of has to, you know, it's always the first thing. It's, that's where everything starts. But acceptance is, is massively important. And so I feel like that's probably the the most challenging um, aspect of it. How do you think perhaps like changing one's perspective or mindset or philosophy around some of the things like you mentioned earlier, something that struck me is perhaps an, an irrational thought, like I have to perform great this weekend, right? That certainly not a, a necessarily a rational thought because like you said, they might be playing every weekend. Nothing terrible is really going to happen. If they don't perform, you know, at least on the scale of say, of terribleness, you know, zero to a hundred, it's not a hundred, right, right, um, right. You know, dying is probably a hundred, <laughs> um, or or something <laughs> like that. 
Um, so do you work with players on different perspectives on say how to view competition in, in a different way? So, because I mean, tennis obviously being an individual sport, we do feel that pressure. It's not like a team sport where, you know, Hey, Josh was awful today. So I don't feel so bad. You know, that's why we lost. Um, it's got more to do. You know, I can't run away from that, but then also we're talking about rankings, you know, so it's a natural comparison. I think UTR, as much as I like that rating system, I do find it um, can have challenges for, for people, the way they the way they view it. It may at times discourage actual participation from certain matches, uh, given the matchup. Um, so I'm curious how you might work, or, uh, you know, different perspectives, healthier perspectives with respect to competition, match situations, challenges, etc. Yeah, that's a great that's a great question. Um, you know, I, I would say the the as as so as much as we know that okay, uh, focusing on the process versus the outcome is sort of the, the way to go. Um, but you know what I've discovered is that especially nowadays, kids nowadays, juniors, um, uh, they have incredibly high aspirations. It's like they ask so much of themselves, um, not only on the court, but off the court as well in school, other activities, you know, everybody's looking to go into a great college, maybe, maybe play college tennis, maybe not, but really everybody's striving for amazing things in life. And I think it's great that, that they are there at that stage, you know, so it's kind of like telling athlete, telling an athlete, uh, you know, like, oh, don't worry about the you know, don't worry about the score. Don't worry about this or that. You know, that actually can be tricky because it's, you know, it's almost like by our DNA as athletes is that we want that perfection. It's like we are all, you know, we, we, we love we love when it's all clicking. We love when we're winning. And that's the that's the best feeling. So that's something that that I like to actually leave. I like to leave that alone because that's a massive drive behind the effort that you're going to give. And now channeling that effort is really that's actually the the, the kind of the, the interesting part is what do you channel that into and what is that process that you may be channeling that into so um, you know if 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 we think about uh, you know if you're thinking about the ranking if you're thinking about the opponent if you're thinking about the results um, uh, is that where you need your mind to be right now. And if not, then what is that? You know, so it's sort of like that acronym WIN, what's important now. Um, and I, that's something that, that I use a lot because it's, if people hear WIN, they get excited, but then I kind of throw the other part in and I'm like, well, right, but how are we going to do that? Essentially, that's not just going to happen. It's like, there's a process to that. There's a journey to that. So, um, you know, the, the, and, and then it's, okay, how can we channel that? What is it that you specifically want to do? What is it, you know, what is one thing that you are going to promise to yourself today or commit to that is up to you that you know you can execute and you will stand by? And that could be moving my feet. That could be energy. That could be effort. That could be, um, you know, it even, I mean, I guess if, if you're, working on something technical that's a little bit tricky i mean when you're competing you maybe don't want to get too technical but if it's a new thing you know you if you're working on new timing with a split step let's say maybe you want to commit to that and just use this tournament to really see how that lives and breathes in a competitive environment um so i would say it's more like you know channeling that drive and that excitement that a player has in a way that is actually going to be tangible when they compete and, and helping them grasp that whole relationship between process and outcome. Um, you know, that would maybe be the, the one way that, that I kind of, uh, what I like to do when, when um, you know, uh, to, to answer your question, really. Yeah, I like that. And, and I think that's, that's a good distinction. I, I, I've often thought of when I think about process and outcome more like the broad, focus versus narrow focus, you know, at a very broad level, of course, we want to win. And I know that's like part of your DNA. So, you know, we don't even need to worry about that. But we need to know what your recipe is to create mm -hmm. that. And I often like to use the recipe thing because most people, whether they're kids or adults, have done some cooking or baking. 
And so they get it, you know, and a recipe has got ingredients, it's got instructions. It's a really cool way to actually think about the process and it how is. you can have really high quality ingredients or not, right? Or maybe your instructions are not as complete as they could be. And these are things that you can like tangibly work on in order to create, you know, that ultimately the great performance. I always tell players I work with, you know, my favorite dessert is chocolate cake. So let's just think chocolate cake, chocolate cake. And I'm like, all right, is it starting to appear? No, sadly, <laughs> right? It's not appearing. Well, that's the same with winning. You just thinking win, win, win. It doesn't just show up. There's right. got to be a recipe that you follow. You got to know what the ingredients are, the instructions. And I think that, yeah, that, that breakdown of you understanding that winning is important, right? You know, as a sports psychology professional, we don't want to say, hey, you don't think about that. It's important. We can't deny that right. results are important, right? They are. Um, but it just like, as you said, it's the how. How do you get there? That's the controllable piece. And maybe by focusing on some of those things, whether it's footwork, um, timing. Yeah, I, I agree with you about maybe technical depends what you're working on, where you are in your development plan. You know, maybe it's just your strategy. You want to hit high and deep to, to somebody's backhand the entire time. Yeah, the more you do that, I think that that can uh, help sort of manage some of the the anxious moments of a match. Right. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, and that, that's the, you know, it, uh, you, you know, when you ask people, you know, what are you going to commit today and, and what are you going to sort of promise to yourself that you're going to do? It, usually they come back with some sort of a, an energy answer, you know, keep my feet moving, mm -hmm. make sure I'm stepping in, make sure that I am, you know, bouncing make sure that there's some sort of a of a of a flow kind of an answer that that they give um they do give something technical but usually it's something that's more of an effort based yeah. uh because that really that yeah, yeah effort I, I feel like might be the only thing that you can actually really execute that's on you um whatever that is even if, if you're sick if you're tired if you are uh not feeling well if you're sad you can still give a hundred percent of whatever you can offer today if that's 20 percent i can give a hundred percent of that 20. um but it's you know that's sort of the idea that uh, and and you, if you do that then you really do the best you can and that's all you can ask of yourself in a way as well but magical things do happen when you actually follow through on your own commitment and your own promise to yourself i mean that's just an amazing feeling um so no I, absolutely and i like i like what you're talking about in terms of uh you know making the most of whatever you have on on any given day um back to back to you know the conversation a little bit about um anxiety and managing um those nerves that that might come up um in, in a match how, how do you and, and you know we, we talked a little bit about this concept of mindfulness and uh, really staying in the present moment. I guess how, when people are competing or really preparing for competition, how do you help players um, stay in that in that present moment um, as they're competing rather than getting caught up in the, you know, in the future and the what ifs, you know, what if I lose this match this weekend? What if my, you know, what if I, uh, you know, don't win the tournament and my UTR drops or my ranking drops? How do you help players, you know, focus on that process and on those things that can control by, you know, by staying in that present moment rather than getting too ahead of themselves. Yeah, that's a, that's definitely, you know, a million dollar question. We're all talking about being present nowadays, be present, be present, be present. And then, but people don't know really how, right. It's what does that really even mean? Um, and, uh, and I, I think, uh, you know, th th there are so many ways we can be present and, uh, Usually if it's kind of like if, you know, what I like to ask, I like to ask a lot of questions to players instead of, you know, it's kind of like I discovered, you know, even though I've been a coach longer than, than uh, you know, being a mental coach, but, you know, for about 20 years, I've been coaching really different levels. And, uh, uh, and I'm a big fan of asking reflective questions, you know, so just to help them raise awareness, you know, because they, they have enough people telling them what to do in their, in their life. I kind of don't want to be one, another one. Um, even though obviously you have to, you know, you have to coach and, and give 
tips and, and help. Um, but, you know, one, one of the things, for example, uh, if, if you are nervous versus, you know, completely calm, just chill, you know, how does your heart rate change? You know, is it, where is it? Where are you experiencing? You know, how are you experiencing or your, or your breath? Um, so it's, you know, going back to just being aware of identifying where you experience something that's different in your body uh, is a good way to accept it. Um, and then, you know, take a, take a, take a breath that can, that can sort of even it out. They can calm, you can calm yourself down. Uh, but being present, being with your breath, where it is, um, is a good way to actually be present. Uh, being, being where your feet are is another great way. Um, your feet are always present and they're always in the moment that they need to be in. But are we mentally in that same moment? Are we synchronized, you know, with our feet, sort of like our, our mind and our feet? Um, uh, you know, so and then when it comes to, for example, thought management in a way, um, you know, what, what I found is that letting go is a is a is, is a great way that helps. Because um, sometimes, you know, can I, you know, what can you control if I ask people that? Um, they give you the answer, but then that, you know, sort of, I, I guess it's, a, I guess it's a, a, maybe not the biggest fan of the word simply because I think, I think it's limiting a little bit. You know, it's like, if I try to control something, then I might be successful, but then if it changes, if it comes back, I might need to do something different about it. Um, and so, you know, change is kind of like the only thing you can really count on in, in your life. That's a, Con, con, that's constantly going to be happening. That's change, and so in a way, how flexible can you be? How adaptable can you be to to these experiences that could be coming back, and it could be you could be feeling them differently, um, and just you know riding that wave, being there with them, leaning into them in a way. If it's if your heart rate is increased, if you are if your breath is all up in your nose as opposed to kind of like evenly spread out, you know, through through your belly and and and, and your chest. Um, in a way, just being able to identify how you feel and where you experience it, how you experience it, I think it's a great way to to be a, to be accepting of it. Um, in, in a way, you put out this welcome mat for whatever's happening, and and if you can be kind to yourself with it and compassionate to yourself with it, I think it's a fantastic start and a fantastic way to um, to to actually calm down or to slow down or to um, you know, then you start to notice how, how actually how you feel differently. And, and if you pay attention to that, you are present. Um, and even if you feel that your mind is all over the place and you know, people think, oh, you know, I can't really, I don't know how to meditate. I don't know how to stay present. But if you're aware that you are actually, that your mind is all over the place, you actually are being aware. Um, and, and you are being present, the fact that you know that. So now it's, you know, coming, going back to it, like, well, but do you need, you know, where do you need your mind to be right now? Um, oh, I need it to be on, you know, uh, on my target for my CERT. Awesome. Just bring it back, you know? So that's, that's, that's all the information you need. So, um, you know, I just feel like if, if we get to know our physical states a little bit more, um, it's a good way to be present. It's a good way to uh, manage the extra information, the, the, the monkey mind and the thoughts, the racy thoughts that, that we have all the time. But I think it's a good way to bring it back to something physical uh, because, you know, because we disregard it, but it's always there with us. You know, our breath is always there. It changes, but it's always there. Obviously, we need it. So, um, you know, if we can come back to that or if we can come back to our feet, be where your feet are, I think it's a good way to be present and, and actually understand the concept. So I, I, I like that, and I, I, but I'm curious because I think one of the things that we have as a challenge as mental coaches is, all right, how do we start integrating that into practice and routines so that it can actually be done, uh, you know, with some level of proficiency in competition, which hopefully gets better. So, you know, when you're working – with a player maybe on the court or a group of players, Nicola, what, what are some ways or, you know, drills or things that you're doing? How do you incorporate the breathing into that? How do you teach maybe the routines? I'm just curious, like maybe from a more practical, um, because I think coaches are also always looking for ways. So how do we integrate more of this stuff, more of these mental skill training things into 
our encore practices because I think ultimately that's the best way to teach mental skills because then it becomes a kind of just how we do things. So I'm, I'm curious, you know, how, how you handle that when you're on the court. Yeah, that, that's, 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 that's the bottom line, right? Like that, that's really what we're looking for. Um, uh, you know, I think practice matches are a great way to, to potentially use some of these concepts. And I think it's because it, you know, I think it's hard to replicate the competitive environment in its entirety and really all the challenges that are there, the people, the venue, the smell of the, of the court, you know, the, it's just, it's a little bit tough to, to do that, but um, we can, you know, we can, I think we can bring it pretty closely. Um, so, you know, I, I feel like that can be done different ways and, and we can get really creative with it. Um, but I know that with um, in some of the, some of the academies where I used to work, I mean, we had, um, you know, we had designed, uh, let's say mental weeks or mental training weeks, you know, where every, and, and it's mostly competition, for example. So, uh, so that we focus on using the routine, it, it, you focus really what hap what's happening between points before matches and after the matches, rather than, I mean, you, you are obviously playing with intention, um, but in a way, you're shifting your focus to try to develop and, and really see how you feel when you do the routine. Um, how does it feel, you know, when you go to the towel and what you do with the towel um, versus the strings, you know, for example. So I know that if I'm you, if I'm playing, I prefer the towel. The strings drives me drive me crazy. There are too many of them. Um, but the towel is something that I love to, you know, it's a, like if I wipe my face. It also is almost like I wipe the board clean and then I can start writing on it again. Um, so it's something that, and you know, you just cover your face. You have a moment for yourself. Uh, even if you are in the middle of, of, of in between two courts, um, but it just, you know, for five seconds, just to get a little bit of a breather, just to kind of ground yourself. And so, um, you know, you, using, using routines, for example, is a great way to practice in practice matches, um, um, I used to, you know, I used to run a, a mental classroom. So there was group training uh, on a daily basis. Uh, and so in the classroom, we would develop a lot of, I would talk about the pre-match preparation or the post-match reflection. What, you know, what should go into that? What are the things that we need to consider? Um, but in terms of drills, I think you can, you know, you can make any drill about a mental skill. Um, and even even in a drill where you are trying to keep 20 balls mini tennis cross court you know forehand to forehand you know make it make it as basic as it is uh what is your self talk here you know what are you actually thinking about or telling yourself when you're doing this i mean let's see how aware the players are and then we can then take it from there in terms of okay well maybe think about this or consider this given what the drill is given what the objective is uh, but I feel like we, you know, there, there are uh, there are drills, uh, technical drills. I mean, in terms of using imagery, for example, you know, if uh, if you're practicing to serve, or um, if you are, you know, goal setting. You know, if you're working on something new, you can incorporate that. You know, goals for today, just one goal. What is one goal that they, what, what is it? What is that we're working on today? What is it that you would like to accomplish today? And so. Um, I think we can make any tennis drill, there's a mental component to it. I think that's why it's such a mental game. Uh, but uh, we can get really creative in that sense that um, I think as coaches, I think it's important for us to start to link all of these things and use the language that is, you know, going to be, talk about self-talk. I mean, you know, the, the, I, I think as coaches, we have a massive role because the words that we use can stay with a player forever and that can be positive it can be negative i mean a word you use can really slice someone like a like a knife or it can heal them from maybe even a traumatic experience that they've had so we we are have such a powerful such a essential role to play and so i think if if you know if we can get creative with it so that we talk about the emotion, emotional piece mental piece technical piece tactical piece physical piece uh, I think there are so many ways we can be creative and, and incorporate that. But practice, as you said, Brian, absolutely is the time to uh, 
uh, to develop this. I mean, I think about Nadal. Um, I feel, I think to him practice is like a matter of life or death, you know, and, and, uh, and then, you know, he tries to develop these things and then goes into matches and sort of just does it. But now obviously you have the crowd, you have the media, you have, uh, it's a little bit of a different environment. Um, but, uh, but in terms of what's on you, in terms of what's up to you when you're on the court, I think we can bridge that gap a lot closer uh, and I think we do have a lot of room that, to improve in that sense, for sure. Yeah, I think so as well. And I, I'm glad you brought up the mini tennis thing, Nicola, because I think I think that's actually a great place to start with teaching some mental skills because the tennis aspect of it is relatively simple. It's not taking up a lot of your mental space. So you actually have more room to think about your breathing, your self-talk, some awareness. And I think you know when we even just let's say you're warming up, Many people will look at mini tennis as a way of, you know, trying to just get their strokes warmed up. But it's a great place to start warming up your mental game, really seeing the ball. You know, we had uh, Sean Brawley on in one of our episodes, you know, talking about bounce hit. Do bounce hit in mini tennis as a yeah, way. It's, of, it's a great tool. Yeah. yeah but as a, as a way of turning yourself on, right? It's a really, uh, in some ways, it's an underutilized time from a mental perspective to work on a few basic things that could then set you up as you move further and further back, right? The further and further back we go, the more complex the whole, you know, piece of tennis becomes, right? We're creating more distance, et cetera. We're hitting the ball harder. Um, and we tend to you know, focus, we've got less mental space to, to go to those things. And so I think you're right. The more creative we can be on those things, the more we can make just the practice court where we're, we're working on these as skills, I feel sometimes when people come to professionals like us, they're looking for techniques, which almost feels like, oh, I can do this thing one time and it's going to work. And it's like, that's nah, not really it. It's, it's actual skill that you need to integrate into how you do things, just like you're learning a kick serve or the continental grip or, or whatever technique piece. It's the same. And I think the more that we Absolutely. understand the treatment of that, uh, the, the better, you know, we'll be able to actually communicate what we're trying to do with players. Right, right. Absolutely. And, and maybe, um, you know, one thing that I always think about is how can we really help help these players? How can we prepare them for the challenges of the of the competitive world? But also ju just life. I mean, tennis mirrors life in so many ways. And and. Uh, you know, how can we do them a service versus a disservice in in preparing them for what they're, you know, some of the challenges and at least uh, on a certain level so that they can feel ready to to step into, uh, you know, outside of the practice arena. But, um, you know, so so maybe practicing the way you would compete could help uh, just practicing with intention and, and understanding why you do what you do. Um, but I'm, I'm just a big fan of, of everybody sort of needs to make it their own and so as coaches i personally i just love to ask a lot of reflective questions so that they start to also think for themselves because i feel like younger kids nowadays i mean uh you know they have people telling them stuff all the time and so you it's easy to shut the brain off and just take that blindly follow someone's advice which is clearly that they, they trust us uh, and that's wonderful. Um, but then, you know, when they are competing, there will be no us. It's going to be them and you're going to be left to your own devices. And so uh, how, how can we help them actually manage that on their own? And I know it's, I mean, at a, you know, as a 12 year old, you really just want to be 12 as well as, as you know, you're competing. It's important to have to, to, to just be a 12 year old. I, I think that's essential. Um, so, but you know, it's like just, be, being able to help them, um, you know, manage that, manage all the emotions in the competitive environment that can be, that can be really raw uh, in at early age. You know, it's like you're you're out there by yourself, and you've got parents on the side, you've got coaches. People are going crazy sometimes, and it you know opponent, and then everybody you know pointing fingers, cheating, this and that. Um, so it's tough, you know, it's like at, at that age to, to manage, it's tough for anybody, let alone for, for a kid 12, 13. Um, and so, you know, so it's kind of like, I always think, you know, how can, how can I be the best support, um, you know, for them, but in a way that they feel comfortable 
facing these things, you know, as, as, as best way as we can. Um, so, but we can get creative for sure. Absolutely. So um, to, to sort of shift gears just a little bit, um, I, I know your background, you, you know, you've, you've had some, some unique experiences in your background, whether it be uh, in college um, as a performer, um, you know, studying theater or working for the United Nations. Um, so, so I'm wondering how these um, diverse, diverse experiences that you've had has changed your perspective um, as a sports psychology practitioner and the, that perspective that you have. Uh, good question. You guys are on a roll <laughs> with these questions. I'm like, you know, it's like, <laughs> it's, uh, it's really, you really on makes, your me <laughs> makes me think. Makes me think. You guys, are, you guys are, you guys are pros. Um, uh, yeah, the, you know, it, it's, uh, it's interesting. I, I don't, uh, well, I, I think it's, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a personally just a big, big fan of, of exploring ourselves in different ways. I think we, we are, there's so much to us and, and I, you know, so I, I feel like all these experiences have been super valuable for for me, I mean, ha having been an actor, uh, I studied theater and psychology, and having been on stage, I mean, that was that that was a massive experience for me. Then, in terms of experiencing that sort of environment, being in the spotlight, you know, having to deliver lines, having to perform, show show, follow the script, show emotion, not show it, you know, what whatever it was. But now, I actually probably have the bet twenty, you know, fourteen years later. If I'm giving a presentation, if I'm public speaking, that's actually where it comes in. Having been on stage back then, now for me, it's really not too big of a challenge to get up in front of however many people. It doesn't really matter. Uh, and the more, the better, actually, because I can feed off of more people. I can feed off of people's energy more. Um, and so it's a little bit easier to actually speak if it's a bigger group. Um, uh, but uh, that's, for example, where that comes in. And you know, when it comes to the, the, the UN work or that business environment, um, I, I saw a lot of similarities with uh, working with coaches or working with athletes in terms of staff and let's say managers in that environment. You know, it's, it's been, I think it's um, uh, people kind of look at, you know, look, look at you, if, if you say, being a performer, people think about athletes, they maybe think about stage performers, but the truth is, is that people in the corporate world are also performers. I mean, they're performing in their daily life work uh, based on that environment that they're in and based on uh, certain standards, uh, as we spoke about in the, at the beginning. So, um, uh, you know, if, if, if there are still teams over there, they have to work with a, among a team. They have a, they have a manager, which is kind of like the coach maybe. So I think, you know, bringing in some of the concepts that comes from sport, they do translate into, let's say the corporate environment, but they, I think obviously need to be tailored to the needs of that. You can't really just copy and paste things. That's not how anything works, but you can make them relevant. You can definitely use some of the concepts, you know, 100%. Um, and so to me, it's just been, uh, it gave me another experience, another perspective. Um, and I, uh, you know, I'm a big fan of, of experiencing different things, a variety of experiences so that you can then really understand, you know, just develop different angles of, of view, different perspectives, different lenses, um, and be able, it's kind of like speaking different languages. You know, if I, there are certain expressions that, that, that are in, in Serbian language that I, obviously draw from daily because they really hit the spot of what is it that I'm trying to think about versus in English and the other way around. And so uh, if I need to think about something a different way, it's helpful that I can use a different language because the word actually clicks and it's easier for me to let go of something that's hurting me or it's easier for me to understand something if I use a word that's in a different language. And this is similar, you know, like if, if I am faced with a, with a situation I can draw from my experience at the UN, I can draw from my experience as a player or as an actor. Uh, and luckily I have these choices. And so I think the more choices we have, the better. Um, 
in in general. Um, and I just feel like we develop parts of ourselves that we can that can help us in other areas of life. So I, I I'm I'm always just been kind of like a big fan of uh, doing uh, as many as much variety, having you know variety as a spice of life type of thing. Um, that's something that resonated with me. But again, not everybody prefers that. Maybe you know people really maybe want to stay focused in in one thing and um, and sort of um, you know grind that out and but one thing that really connected all of these experience is performance that is whether i'm a tennis player an actor or in an office i'm a performer and so that is the piece that really for me connects all of that that's actually the common denominator uh over the years um so that's kind of like how i connect everything i i, I but you know i do need to have that foundation i gotta have one term that like an umbrella term that I can put everything under because otherwise you can get lost too. It's like, you know, what, what am I, you know, it's kind of like having more than one brain, you know, but um, so it's having that common denominator definitely, uh, definitely helps. But I, and, you know, and then you, if I venture into doing something, learning a new skill or whatever, it's easier than co to, to connect it to something, you know, um, it doesn't have to be as scary, you know, because, um, you, you have some experiences already that you can kind of draw from uh, while being open, obviously, to that new experience. So I think it's just, a, um, you know, I don't know. I, I, I just love the fact that, that we can, we have that capability to try different things, to do different things, and to, um, and to bring these experiences back into the hub of what is it that kind of connects them all. I, you know, I, think, it's a, I think it's a great thing. And what, what you're saying there and, and, and what I'm hearing, Nicola, is actually reminding me of sort of more of a positive psychology perspective on things, which is, a, you know, a, a strengths-based focus. And perhaps you utilizing some of your own character strengths, whether that be performing or uh, perhaps it's uh, maybe deeper. Maybe it's a love of learning and that you've brought those to a different, you know, set of contexts, whether that be theater tennis, some other skill, learning languages, for, for example. Um, and I think that's a great way for us to look at all the people we work with is to have them take a strengths-based approach, not only maybe with their tennis game, right? You know, hey, you should hit more forehands and backhands, um, but also just, you know, from your character perspective, are you someone who, you know, has a love of learning? Is courage a, uh, maybe a character skill of yours that's a strength? Um, creativity, etc. Um, you know, and there are different surveys, obviously, out there that one can explore your your create your uh, your your sort of strengths, character strengths and skills. Um, how, how do you? Uh, maybe I'm just you know just throwing this at you, you know, without any sort of prep. But how much are you looking at maybe that that angle with people that you work with? You know, what their strengths are, not just as performers, but as people. I do. I do. And that's something that I've recently discovered that and that's actually where my mind goes uh, sort of subconsciously. But now I'm actually conscious about it, th that it is. I, I think strengths are we I feel like we don't play enough to our strengths um, because we naturally maybe thinking, OK, these are this is, you know, we kind of take it for granted. It's like, yeah, 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 I'm good at that. But this is the area of improvement for me. This is what I'm working on. You know, we right. uh, we That's get right. excited. We want to get we want to crack this thing. We want to get really, the, you know, get it perfect. Um, but it's sort of like ch charging your phone. You know, it's like if the battery is getting empty, you need some sort of an outlet to power it back up. And the, that outlet to me, I think is actually the, the things that we are good at already, things that we are, that are our strength. Um, and so then it's that, you know, dance between the two and that relationship between the two. So yes, definitely. That's actually more, I'm realizing that more and more that that's kind of natural to where, where my, where my, maybe my style in a way is starting to take shape and form. So, but that's the recent thing. I, uh, that kept coming up in the past. And I just kind of was like, Oh, that's that interesting. That came up, but then, you know, you, I disregarded it or I just kind of put it back, but then now it's coming back more and more. And I'm, I'm starting to pay attention to it more in terms of maybe there's something to this. Um, so yes, to answer your question. Uh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. And the research is supporting that view that, you know, the strengths based approaches, 
is, is, is definitely a, a more fruitful one. And, and in fact, when you look at even, let's just take it to like a tennis perspective, you look at the top players, none of them are great at everything. But what they all have is one or two things that are world-class super strengths. That's something that distinguishes them from other players. And it's all different, you know, so Federer, you might say, you know, the, the accuracy with his serve is a super strength of his. You know, that's that's why his serve stats are so good. Uh, mm. Nadal, it might be his mental game and his forehand. Djokovic, it's, you know, his defensive game, ability to turn defense into offense is a super strength of his, you know. And But would you say Djokovic's actual serve is one of the best on the tour? Probably not. But what are you going to have him spend more time on? You're going to have him spend more time on what wins him matches, which is, you know, mm. working on, 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 you know, his, his footwork, his ability to just play high percentage tennis all the time. Um, and so I think it's, uh, yeah, it's fruitful how we talk about that because you're right. Even as coaches, we're always looking at, well, you got to improve that weakness and this and that. And I think the more we can get players, especially as they get older, you know, once you get a player to maybe 16, 17, 18, and their game is maturing, mm. then it's time to think about, okay, which of my natural strengths do I want to turn into a super strength so that it can distinguish me from others? Because I think, and, and a lot of players don't like to hear this, but becoming well-rounded means becoming mediocre. You're just going to be sort of good at a lot of different things, but you won't be great at any one thing. And that's really where the E players right. are, is they're great at a, a, a very few things. I mean, this is sort of an American football example, but like Tom Brady, he's great at a very few things. Running isn't one of them. You know, and you wouldn't suggest to Tom Brady that he work on his footwork over the summer. That's just not going to do it for him. You know, it's, it's other things. And I think the more that we can get, you know, those older players to realize, okay, this is kind of who you are now. Let's start doubling down on your identity as a player and, and, and really going with, with that. Um, mm. you know? yeah. So it, I think the research is showing that, and it actually shows it much more even in the working world. Right. Right, 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 right. Yeah, that's an interesting point. Yeah, for sure. I haven't thought about it that way, I guess. Uh, but yeah, no, that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I guess going going back to back to a little bit about what, what Brian was saying with um, you know some of these top players and uh, you know l looking at their strengths um, from from your experience, uh, Nicola, working with different you know high performance players, junior players, um, you know professional players, whoever it may be. What 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 have you found to be some of the um, the, the the biggest things that I guess the the, the common factors that I guess hold hold players back from you know achieving achieving what they you know what what they want to set out for or, or what they they think is possible for themselves and I guess you know what what do you find sometimes hold some of these players back? Uh, yeah, Ooh, that's uh, I mean, I don't know if I can point out to one thing uh, necessarily. But, but I would say it's probably that, um, you know, that, that ability to maybe self-manage. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, it's a little bit about what we talked about, sort of, you know, just being able to, if, if not needing someone to ask them certain questions, that certain questions they can ask themselves, certain things that they can think about, reflect on, draw from experiences, strengths, areas of improvement, all, you know, all of the above. Um, but I think the, the the fact that, yeah, the, just, um, uh, it's almost like there are certain blocks in, in the way that are preventing them from just un, un, you know, letting it rip unleashing their best version of themselves, letting the whole world see it. Um, and, uh, and I think there are many reasons for that. I think some of that really stems from, it can stem from childhood, you know, it can still stem from 
who your first coach was to, to who your last coach was to, you know, a relationship with your parents. I mean, it's really multifaceted in that sense. I mean, you know, if you, if you consider an athlete, I mean, you really have to kind of look at th their life, uh, a holistic approach, essentially. Um, but, um, uh, but, you know, having, I, I feel like it's, it's almost like, is there, is there, um, you know, is there a space, uh, and how well can you set the stage for someone to be successful and for them to do that for themselves? But then all of us who are in the support, who are in the, you know, the boxing term in the corner for us to do that, you know, and, um, uh, you know, can we create that space, space and can we, can we set the stage to, you know, for, for, for our athletes to, to be successful as people, not, not really only as athletes necessarily. Um, and so it comes back to that, what values maybe you have, maybe, you know, what got you, what, what, what got you into tennis in the first place? You know, um, what do you love about it? What are you passionate about the game? You know, is there something that, what does it mean to you? Um, you know, kind of like what is your purpose maybe even through this sport that goes be above and beyond it. Um, but, but I think these are maybe some of the, I guess, let's say philosophical questions that I think we do need to ask ourselves because, um, you know, when you look back, uh, what was that journey? What was all that about? You know, what, what, what did you discover about yourself? You know, what is it that you are, um, what are you known for? What do you want to be known for? What is, what, what is this? What is your purpose in a way? Um, and so, you know, I feel like because it's a combination of things, there are different things that we can draw from, but again, it gives us an opportunity to do that. So, um, that's why it's so tough to, to maybe pick, pick one or two things, but it definitely is, um, in a way, yeah, I guess not, not everybody gets to shine in the spotlight uh, or even be in the spotlight. And again, there are so many things, especially in tennis, that need to click for that to happen. Um, but, uh, you know, so, yeah, I mean, I don't really have an answer other than how do we make that happen? How can we all collaborate, you know, to make that happen? How can we collaborate with parents? How can we collaborate with fellow coaches? Um, with teachers maybe um you know and and i feel like if you have that approach that integrative approach of like you know have, we're all it takes a village to raise a child type of thing if we can figure out a way to do that maybe in in, in every environment or on some level um, i think we can have that space and set the stage for for our athletes kids uh, to to you know to shine and to really be the people they want to be um, as athletes as well. So yeah, it's tough to say, but I, but I feel like, you know, if, if we can maybe think more in that direction, I think we would be, uh, we can help them out more. Yeah. Yeah. Honestly, I think that's a good answer, Nikola. And I heard some different dimensions there in, in your answer. I heard perhaps confidence is a bit, you know, you said maybe that, that ability to put your full self out there. To me, that's like a, a confidence thing, whether it's a, a, a self-belief piece or a, maybe just not a trust in your game at a certain level. But then you also brought up motivational things, right? Why am I doing this? Uh, you know, what's driving me to, to do that? And you're right. If we can, as a, a holistic sport performance team, create an environment where we can help the player develop the right kind of confidence that they need to perform, the right relationship with with anxiety that you have obviously uh, learned to, to to develop and and for doing it for the right reasons, um, you know, and so that those maybe though I think those are big keys when you look at sort of that umbrella term of mental toughness. Certainly, confidence and uh, motivation are big parts of that. Focus, you know, another area of your work in terms of mindfulness, etc., is, is a big. You know, those are big three huge dimensions in there. And I think those are really good for us as a performance team to keep in mind. It's like, all right, are we getting, are we instilling the right perspectives there? Because, yeah, even at the elite level, I know Josh is asking about, you know, what's holding pro players back. They're just as human as we are. And you can watch a, a top-level match and see 
um, you know, some mental ups and downs. And, and we, we've talked about that on this, on this podcast of, all, you know, all the top players, they all go through it. They may get through it faster than, than some of us. They may rebound more quickly, but they're just as human as we are. And that's why I like, you know, your fellow Serb there. Djokovic has talked about how um, even he has doubts. I, he had this great post-match uh, press conference. I want to say it was like the Wimbledon 2019 semifinal, or maybe it was after the final against Federer, where he had these massive doubts in that fifth set against Federer uh, about, you know, could he succeed in that situation? And I was like, that's great because he's showing us he's human just like we are. Even the best player in the world has doubts. But then he talked about how he shifted it, you know, to saying, all right, yeah, I have these doubts, but, you know, I had to constantly remind myself. That's what he said in the interview. I had to constantly remind myself that I belong here and that I'm better than the other guy. And it's just like that. It's just that little bit, you know, can we can we help our players? Can we help even the players who are, I don't know, 200 to 1,000 in the world figure that out as well? Yeah, absolutely. And as Josh was asking about pro players, I mean, from 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 what I have experienced, it's at that level, relationships, I think, are everything. Um, you know, the relationship that you have with your coach or with your whoever's in your mini team, well, not just team, um, that is really the, the managing that people side is actually uh, that's that's probably the the number one thing because you know every everyone's got the game essentially and you are working on certain tweaks fine tuning um but uh, but the relationship side it is it that's that's really where the key is um and so you know just from from both perspectives to be honest from the coach's perspective from the player's perspective as well because you know um, you know it, it's a two-way street um, and so, but yeah, I, I, that's from what I have seen, that is really, that's really massive. Um, and some of the, some of the challenges that, that lie with them currently may have stemmed from relationships in the past that turned sour or for whatever reason, but you know, you carry that stuff into your new relationship. Um, and then it's going to sort of surface again if it hasn't been managed before or you if you don't even know what to do about it i mean it's it's like any relationship you know you new things can happen and you're adapting to the new person so um at the highest level i think relationships are really you know that's where that that's a powerful thing absolutely absolutely um well, I, I think we've gone a little bit over, so we can start to uh, start to wrap this up. Um, Brian, any last uh, last questions or any last things uh, you wanted to address? No, I, I think we we covered a lot of ground here, Nicola, and I really appreciate you uh, sharing your stories and your expertise on, on on these things. And it's been a it's been a great great conversation. So uh, just you know, thank you for coming on to the podcast today. Well, thank you guys for the invite. I mean, it, it was it was amazing. It was really just so pleasant. Uh, great questions. You guys both, I think, are doing a fantastic job with it. You got, you know, you you're a great team in this, uh, and uh, it's, it's a huge huge pleasure to be here. So thank you again for the invitation. Thank you, Nicola. Well, that was a great conversation, Brian. Um, one of my, I, I would say, biggest takeaways was. Uh, this this part of the conversation where we were talking about different experiences that you have in life, um, such as Nicola's uh, work with the United Nations, as well as his uh, background in theater and the performing arts, and how these experiences really lead to um, furthering our perspective and really broadening our perspective. How he compared that to speaking different languages, and how um, if you're you know looking for the right way to to view something, you might be able to view it through a certain lens from, um, let's say, your work with the performing arts or your work with um, other experiences you've had in the past, sort of like um, being able to think of something through one language or through another based on different phrases. So I really liked um, that analogy and that, that uh, portion of the conversation. 
Yeah, and I think that shows, you know, he's kind of a renaissance guy. He's, uh, you know, got an eclectic set of tastes and interests, in it, and I think that's really cool um, and certainly something we can learn from. I think the thing, um, we had kind of a three-way conversation with respect to anxiety, and you really brought up the point about acceptance of it. And, and Nicola talked about how his relationship, he changed that with anxiety, really uh, changing it to one where he was befriending his, his anxiety. And it was almost as if he were, you know, as you said, accepting it more. And it wasn't so much that it was getting in his way. <clears throat> he understood its role in performance and, and then was able to get through that. And I think that's a good story because for many of uh, the people listening, maybe struggling with some stress and anxiety management issues, how can we all change our relationship with those feelings so that they don't get in the way. And I think learning to accept them for what they are, maybe like uh, Nicola said, befriending it, understanding its, uh, its role in performance, and then being able to move through it and understand that you know it's, it's probably a good thing. You need some stress in your life to actually push you forward. So I thought that was a really cool, cool point that, that we actually all brought up. So that was great. So Everyone, that's our show for today. Once again, many thanks to Nikola Malinkovic for being our guest on the podcast. And we want to thank you for listening. For more on today's show, please check out the show notes. If you have any feedback or questions, please email us at tennisiqpodcast at gmail.com. You can also communicate with us at the Twitter hashtag tennisiq. Additionally, please subscribe to the show on your podcast platform of choice, which includes YouTube, so that you can be notified of new episodes. You can also check us out on Instagram, Tennis IQ Podcast. Thanks again, and we'll talk to you soon in our next episode.